Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is Shailene and today I'm doing my September wrap up. I felt like September was such a long month. Hurricane Dorian ended up hitting us and we lost power for like four days. And before the hurricane, one of my cats actually went missing and we still haven't been able to find her. So she's been missing for like a month now. So I've been just really sad and just wallowing in my grief and I just I miss my kitty so so much I really hope that she's able to come back to us but at this point it's looking like that's going to be really unlikely we suspect that uh, she might have been taken by a coyote we don't really know we haven't found any sign of her so yeah if you guys wanted an update on Jellybean, the kitten that I'm fostering, uh, he is now pretty much a foster fail. Uh, because we lost our kitty, my mom uh, decided to keep Jellybean. Um, so we are keeping him. He's a permanent kitty. <laughs> I guess we'll get right into the uh, September wrap up. This month, I feel like I did pretty good with reading books. Um, I didn't read, like I don't read every day and sometimes I find it difficult to read because of my health. So um, yeah, but I think I did, well, I definitely did a lot better than I did in August. In total I read seven books this month. Um, one of them was a DNF, <laughs> four of them were physical, three of them were ARCs, and one was an ebook. So. Yeah, uh, let's just jump right into the wrap up. The first book that I read was Crocodile on the Sandbank by Elizabeth Peters. This is an Amelia Peabody mystery. So I had this book on my shelf for a good five years. And you know what? This ended up being such a good book. Amelia Peabody is this strong feminist female character set in the mid-1800s. Her father dies and she inherits a large sum of money. She decides that with that sum of money she wants to travel the world. One of the first places she ends up is in Rome and while she is in Rome she meets Evelyn, a young girl who has been disgraced by a former lover. She's basically penniless and yeah so Amelia Peabody takes her in, they go traveling to Egypt together where they come across the Emerson brothers who are conducting a dig down the River Nile. So uh, they travel down the River Nile, meet up with the Emerson brothers and weird things begin to happen. There's a mummy haunting the dig site and the workers at the dig site are very superstitious of this mummy so they abandon their work and leave the area uh and yeah it's dangerous times it's quite the mystery it was a good just kind of chill relaxing read like you didn't really need to critique it all that much it was just a fun read i ended up really really enjoying this there is a romance in here which i think this whole series is kind of just like mystery and then romance but there's two romances happening like kind of three I guess you could say um and I didn't really mind the romance yeah I don't know why that is but I just ended up really liking the romance in this which you guys know I don't like romance so it's uh yeah it's a bit of an anomaly <laughs> so this book was actually written in the 70s and it's you know set in a place in Egypt uh so uh there are quite a few racist stereotypes, overtones, undertones, like it's just that really took me out of the story. Because of the racist overtures and stereotypes, whatever in the book, um, I did deduct like a star rating, but, you know, unnecessary. So all in all, I gave this book a four star. I really enjoy it. And I do plan on continuing with the series. There's like 15 books in the whole series, which I'm like kind of excited about because I really did 
love the mystery in here. I am convinced that Amelia Peabody is like Miss Fisher's great grandmother or something like that because <laughs> they just feel like such similar characters to me and yeah in my world I like to think that they're related. <laughs> Okay, so up next I read The Lost City of Z by David Grant. This is a non-fiction book about the explorer uh, Percy Fawcett. He tries to discover the lost city of Z in 1925. Unfortunately, he along with his son and his son's best friend end up going missing in the Amazon and it's been a mystery ever since. You know, what happened to them? Um, there's been many different theories over the years as to the end that they came to. They either starved to death, they got lost to the jungle, or they met a warring tribe that ended up killing them and eating them and whatever else crazy theories have been floated out there. So yeah, um, I'm actually going to be talking about this book more at length in my uh, Nonfiction Fridays video, which will be coming up soon. I don't quite know when I'll put that out, but it'll be soon. I just don't want to spend too much time talking about this. But overall, I really did enjoy this book. I gave it a 3.5 stars. Um, if you are interested in uh, Victorian exploration, um, I suggest for you to give this one a go. There's a lot of great information. There's also um, quite a bit of bibliography that can lead you to uh, further reading, which is always great. So the next book that I read was actually an ARC that I received. This is Queen Meryl by Erin Carlson. This ARC was provided by Hachette Books and Nick Kelly. So this is a non-fiction book um, about the life of Meryl Streep. <laughs> Once again, I will be talking about this because it is a non-fiction more at length in my Nonfiction Fridays video, which will be coming up soon. Um, but uh, I gave this book a 3.5 stars. I actually ended up really enjoying this and I found it was a great read. I learned a lot about Meryl Streep and the roles that she has uh, done over the years. So yeah, um, all in all, it was pretty good. So the next book I read was The Chain by Adrian McKinsey. So the very intriguing plot of this book had me wanting to buy this book right away and just devour it, which I did. I bought it and uh, I devoured it in like two days. This was also a book that was mentioned in my most anticipated reads for uh, the second half of 2019 video. So basically The Chain is a diabolical criminal plot. Um, basically what happens is somebody kidnaps your child and once your child is kidnapped the person that has kidnapped your child calls you gives you these like kind of set of instructions on what to do the chain calls you gives you more instructions and basically you have to go and kidnap a child in order to get your child back and you also have to pay a pretty hefty ransom it's a crazy plot and i'm probably not explaining it all that well but basically this woman, Rachel, her daughter, Kylie, gets kidnapped. She has to go and kidnap a kid. Um, so she gets her ex-husband's brother, Pete, to come and help her kidnap this kid. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's quite the wild ride. And they can't go to the police. They can't go to the media. They can't tell anybody else that they're doing this or that they're a part of the chain like you have to do it or your child will be killed kind of thing. A lot of the perspective of this book follows Rachel's perspective. We get Kylie's perspective a bit, we get a bit of Pete's perspective, and we also get the person who's running the chain. We get kind of get their perspective and their background and their history and everything. So we really get to see why they are doing this kind of thing. This book was fast paced at times and then other times it was just kind of slow and a little bit mundane. A lot of the story is quite original, like this, the overall diabolical plot of having to kidnap someone else's child in order to get your kidnapped child back is, a, you know, it's kind of diabolical. But uh, there was a few predictable bits and bits that I wish wouldn't 
weren't in this book. So the bits of the villain or villains uh, was very cliched. Basically, this is a bit of a spoiler, FYI. They were bullied children um, and uh, because their experience is being bullied, they uh, become kind of very sadistic um, and then they also end up becoming sadistic bullies themselves through this chain plot. I kind of felt like uh, the whole plot where, you know, the villains were uh, sadistic bullies now bullying other people was too cliched. I mean, how many times in books have we seen this? I felt like because the plot of the chain overall was so original, I felt like having a cliche such as that did not mend well with uh, the rest of the book. And then we have a bit of a slight romance going on with Rachel and Pete and honestly, I feel like it was kind of unnecessary. I know that there needs to be maybe like a bit of a tender moment in there with all the, you know, sadistic and crazy stuff that was happening. But I really, did you need a romance? <laughs> I felt it just, you know, it kind of took away from the story and it didn't bring anything original. I would have loved to have had the villains just be evil for the sake of being evil or, you know, them saying that their chain isn't about the money but it actually being about the money or, you know, just wanting to hurt people not because they were hurt and now they feel like hurting people. You know, wanted it to be just a bit different. I didn't want the villains to actually have any reason to be evil. You know, that would have been so much more interesting and then, you know, just we didn't need the predictable romance going on. Because of the unoriginal villains and the romance, like it really lowered my rating. It kind of made me roll my eyes like, you know, I was, I had really high hopes for this book and I was like really expecting with this plot, like, oh god, this plot was just so original and had so much originality and there's so many things you could have done with this, you could have made this book amazing but it really fell short of my expectations of what i wanted it to be so um i ended up giving this a 3.5 stars it's not a terrible book um it is really good and if you don't mind the clichedness of the villains um or the slight romance then i think you'll probably like this um yeah i mean i enjoyed my time reading it and i enjoyed uh you know the thriller aspect of it and everything and it, i think it's like definitely one of the better psychological thrillers that i've read this year but yeah um it still wasn't my favorite so it's definitely 3.5 the next book i decided to pick up which i was so excited to buy this book because the cover is stunning but also i thought the premise was super super interesting and i couldn't wait to read it, like, I knew this was going to be, like, a pretty atmospheric book, and I love atmospheric books. So, The House and Salt of Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. Going into this, I knew that there were going to be ghostly bits, but, um, yeah. Uh, hmm. I have opinions. <laughs> First of all, this cover is absolutely stunning. It's gorgeous. I love it, and for that, just... Just because the cover is so stunning, I'll probably never get rid of this book. And also, like, the inside is also just very pretty. So, just because this book is aesthetic, I'll never get rid of it. But based on the story alone, I would probably give this away. <laughs> uh, that's not a good way to start a review, is it? <laughs> um, so, basically, Analea, she has 12 sisters. Um... Unfortunately, four of them have died, including most recently her sister, and I can't even pronounce her name. I think it's Yuli? I don't know. Anyways, Analia suspects that her sister uh, didn't die of an accident, as everyone believes. 
uh, she suspects that her sister was actually murdered. So she uh, she goes searching for answers. She encounters a mysterious stranger, and she finds a shocking secret about her sister. Meanwhile, Analia's family is just you know they're done with mourning. They just want to live their lives again. Uh, in this here world, when somebody in your family dies, you mourn for like a year and you have to wear black clothing and just do nothing but wallow in your pity and your grief. <laughs> yeah, Analea is shocked by this revelation and it comes from her father and his new wife. Analea's sisters don't see a problem with them not mourning. Uh, they go ahead and begin to plan a big ball. However, there are rumors in town that the family is cursed and that's why all the daughters keep dying. And so when the men come to the ball, they basically shun all the girls and even make fun of them. Fed up with this revelation and wanting to dance the night away all night, every night, they go looking for a magical door that's said to be used by the gods to go from one end of the land to the next. The girls find this here magical door and with this door they're able to travel from place to place and so they go to this here big palace at the other end of the country and they go to this ball where they dance night after night after night wearing out their shoes in the process and baffling their father about why his daughters keep running through so many pairs of shoes. Nothing is as it seems. Strange things are happening. Analea is getting ghostly visions of her sister, her little sister. Verity is even seeing ghosts. She's seeing things that nobody else can see. And she's trying to figure out what happened to Yuli. Is there really a family curse? Yeah, so the plotting of this book is really good. It's really fleshed out. There are a lot of sisters in this book, so uh, there's a lot of names, which I was confused who was who at the beginning of the book for a bit, especially there's like sets of twins and triplets and whatever. So it was kind of hard to figure out who was who. It was a little confusing. There's a lot of names, a lot of girls but they do all have pretty distinct voices. The pacing of this book was pretty average. Like, I don't think it was particularly fast, but it wasn't very slow. It was just, it was just a pretty good pace, which I actually kind of enjoyed. And it definitely did pick up towards the end. Like, it definitely got more faster towards the end when all the stuff was going down. This is like a really wonderfully foggy kind of atmospheric i mean they live in this here huge mansion by the sea and there's like these cliffs and there's waves and it's always like you know foggy and stormy and whatnot so definitely super atmospheric in that sense there's also you know tons of gowns and balls that they're attending there's a lot of mystery and there's mentions of gods and ghosts although the gods in this book aren't like just, you know, deities or whatever. They are physical beings that actually do come down onto earth and they walk among the normal folk occasionally. <laughs> the magical element in this story is only apparent when they walk through the magical door. I absolutely loved when the girls, you know, got ready for ball and went out dancing and had fun. Those were like my favorite parts of this book. Um, I also didn't mind like the spooky bits when Analea was having her visions. Um, they were kind of creepy and weird, but you know, I actually kind of liked it a bit. The ending is very supernatural and creepy and weird and confusing and I really, really, really hated the ending. <laughs> it kind of made me question what was actually real throughout the entire novel and what wasn't. So yeah, I mean it was just, it was way too weird for my taste and I really didn't like it and because, because the ending was so weird and spooky and supernatural, it really kind of tainted my whole, you know, thoughts on this book. I really just i am so torn. Like I love the first half of this book um, but once we get to the ending, like, that's where I really, 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 really hated it. And I really did not like the ending the author chose for this. Yeah, I'm really conflicted. I mean, this is, like, 
I rated it a 3.5 stars, but I don't know. I feel like I want to drop that rating down, but then I also don't want to because I enjoyed the majority of the story, but I just really hated the ending. So yeah, um, I enjoyed it for the atmospheric ocean, you know, mansion by the sea type vibes and the sister relationships and, you know, the dancing, but ultimately, like, the ending was just, no. <laughs> Mm, nope. So the next book I read was another non-fiction book. I actually received this like very late notice and very sporadically um, and you know spontaneously. So um, I saw this here book on NetGalley. It's called As British as the King, Lunenburg County during the First World War by Gerald Hallowell. This is a local history book for me. I saw this in neck alley i requested it i received it like the next day and i only had a certain amount of time to read it so i had like to read it then and because of the this title will be archived on neck alley by the time that my uh non-fiction friday videos goes up um i will be putting the review for this in here as well as in my non-fiction fridays video <laughs> so basically it's about Lunenburg County during the First World War. Uh, basically, it's the county that I live in um, and have grown up in my entire life. It's uh, Lunenburg County, Nova Scotia. Lunenburg is actually a very famous town here in Nova Scotia. Um, the Blue Nose, uh, it's, you know, the schooner that's on our dime comes out of that port. Uh, Lunenburg is also, I believe, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So yeah, it's a pretty famous town. And so yeah, it's all about Lunenburg County during the First World War. I haven't read too many local history. This book delves into so many important topics that had happened during the war, but this book really shows the role that Lunenburg County had played in the war, which I was really surprised at how big a role we had and how big um, Lunenburg County was to like the rest of Canada. Like, I don't know, I feel like Nova Scotia now is kind of like left to the side in the whole, you know, Canada as a whole now today, but I like back then Nova Scotia really had some power in like the rest of Canada. So it was really interesting to see that. The most interesting bits of this book were like the accounts from the newspapers of the time and what they were writing about in relation to the war and also like the perspectives that they had in like uh, it was just some of the stuff they talked about in the papers were actually pretty hilarious and uh, the language is so different back then it's so colorful so that was also quite interesting. Yeah, I was also really surprised to learn how instrumental women in Woodward County were towards the suffragette movement, but also towards women getting the vote in Canada. And, you know, I think, like, we were, like, one of the first to get the right to vote in all Canada, if I'm not mistaken from what I read from the book. I could be wrong. Most terrifyingly <laughs> were the accounts of fishermen off the coast of Nova Scotia that were getting attacked by German U-boats. Um, you know, their schooners would be attacked, their boats would sink, the Germans would capture the Lunenburg fishermen, put them on their U-boats, then set them out in a dory and just like let them go to shore kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Germany basically could have invaded Nova Scotia at any time it liked and that's utterly terrifying to think about if one little thing went wrong in the war and so many things would be so different. What was most amusing <laughs> about this book was the accounts of my town, <laughs> uh, which I'm not going to mention the name my town because we're well, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that online, but like my town had mention of hooliganism and a rum running in this book, which does not come as a surprise. <laughs> That's just, uh, I guess, the way things are. Things really don't change in a hundred years. <laughs> Overall, this was such an enjoyable book and it was so eye-opening and I 
really enjoyed reading it, so I ended up giving this one a five star. Um, I will hopefully be picking up a hard copy of this at some point, I don't know when, but yeah, really enjoyed it. Okay, so the next book I read was basically the only ebook that wasn't an arc that I read this month that I was able to get to. So I read The Last Child by Emily Gunnis and I read this all in one day. So uh, last year I read The Girl in the Letter and it became one of my favorite books of last year. And I was so excited to get this book, get my hands on it, and read it. So like Emily Guinness' last book, we are following a multi-generational story that mainly focuses on women. So the story is following five different points of views. Uh, the story focuses heavily on m mental illness and postnatal psychosis. So there's a storyline set in the past and there's also a storyline that we are following present day. Uh, in the past, when Harriet's husband comes home from the war, she discovers that he is a very changed man. He begins drinking heavily and he starts having flashbacks of the war and becomes very physically abusive towards Harriet. He is eventually committed to an insane asylum and he returns home to his wife and daughter eventually where he continues to abuse his wife and eventually murders her. Their daughter, Rebecca, ends up witnessing this murder, and yeah. None of this is a spoiler as it's like in the first chapter, it's in the description kind of thing. Um, so now we have present day as we are following Rebecca, Harriet's daughter, and we have Iris, who is Rebecca's daughter, and then we have Harvey, who is Rebecca's ex-husband. While they are all trying to locate Jesse, Iris's half-sister and Rebecca's daughter that she had with Harvey. She has just given birth to a child and is experiencing postnatal psychosis and the baby's actually quite sick. She's fearing that the doctors are going to harm her baby so she ends up taking the baby and leaving the hospital and running away and not telling anybody where she's going, what she's doing, whatever. She basically kidnaps her own child so yeah, there is a big search for her. It's making like news headlines kind of thing. So they're trying to find her. Plenty of shocking family secrets are revealed and uncovered and it really makes for a really engrossing read and page turner. Is The Lost Child as good as The Girl in the Letter? Not quite. Um, I think The Girl in the Letter left such a bigger impact on me than The Lost Child, but I still ended up thoroughly enjoying The Lost Child and really really love it. Like I, if you haven't read an Emily Gunness book yet, you need to. Her stories are amazing, especially if you love historical fiction or complex female characters. It's just so so good. You can usually find her books for pretty cheap, um, especially as an ebook. so I highly recommend you check her out. It's great. I really love her stories. Yeah. Four star. The last book that I read, which I actually DNF'd, <laughs> uh, is The Water Dancer by Tanechi Coates. It pains me saying that, but yeah. Um, I actually got an archivist from a Random House Publishing Group and NetGalley. Yeah, so uh, this is such a huge book release at the moment. Uh, Oprah announced that it's her book club of the month pick and people are going crazy over it. It's getting really, really high praise. So yeah, uh, it, this is the story of young Hiram Walker. He was born into slavery. He discovers he has something magical about him. He gets the courage to escape bondage. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, this book has completely blown up and it, it really kind of hurts me that I had to DNF this, but I tried to get into this book for like a month or more. Uh, um, I didn't mark this as like currently reading on my Goodreads for a while because I kept trying to get into it. I would read like a chapter or two and then I'd go and read another book because I was kind of bored with this book and I know so many of you were like screaming at me right now but um, I couldn't get into it. I think there's just a few reasons why I think 
like mood is like the biggest reason it's fall i am not at this time during fall i want to be reading thrillers i want to be reading something fast paced um and i want to be reading something a bit creepy and uh, this wasn't any of those things this was more of a hard hitting slow kind of book which i would more reserve for like um january february kind of months so i think this is a book that i'm going to have to pick up again especially with a hard copy because i felt like this book was just going on and on and on like the chapters were long and i just found myself bored and distracted and the writing is very lyrical which i like but it's also so slow it's very very slow and i'm just not in the mood for slow read at the moment um i pushed myself to get to 50 percent of this book to see if i would end up if it would you know if it would pick up if i would end up liking it anymore to continue reading it at this point and the simple answer was no it was dragging my reading i could have read like a lot more books if i just see enough of this and realized you know that you know this ain't working but because it was an arc i wanted to give it a chance i gave it everything i had but it just it didn't end up working out for me and you know it uh, killed me saying that because i feel like i'm kind of the outlier in all of this because everybody is loving this book at the moment and i'm like the only one that had to deal with it <laughs> or the, at least that's what it feels like <sighs> pretty bummed that I had to DNF that, but that's just the way life is sometimes. All in all, I actually had a pretty decent reading month. I'm hoping that October will be a bit better because, you know, I am so behind on so many books and my TBRs are just huge and huge and huge. You'll probably be seeing in a few days what I mean by that, but yeah. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I will have all my links to my Instagram, my Gerda Reads, and my Twitter linked below so you can go ahead and follow me there. And I hope to see you guys next time. Bye!